happier in my life than I am right now. Amen. Feel like I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. The only, the only, the only heavy burden I carry is for my daughter's work. <laughs>
in the blessed everlasting life of Christ through his or mine or our union with Christ. That is what eternal life is. It's spoken of in Romans 5.21. It says in Romans 5.21, So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul continues in Romans 6, 4, he says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of his Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Just as Jesus was resurrected, we too will be resurrected to a newness of life, and that newness of life is the eternal life. Jesus defined this in his high priest prayer to the Father in John 17, 3, speaking as a high priest would speak, he said, and this is eternal life that you may know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus is praying to his Father there that, that, that we would come to a realization of who he is. It is the life of the age to come that we speak of. Our eternal life is the life of the age to come. And that comes from Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. It says, and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show us exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus we will understand the riches that we have received through the grace of God. Believers will most fully experience this in their perfect, unending glory and holiness, which they will experience in joy in heaven. It's hard to put all those words together and actually understand what they all mean. But we will experience a perfect, unending glory that will be accompanied by perfected holiness and joy in heaven as we reign with Jesus Christ. That's saying a lot in a few words. Listen to these words from Romans 8, 19 through 23. And you've heard these words before. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, it says, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption onto the glorious liberty of the children of God. God. And it continues, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, when we will be perfected. You know, I watched my two brothers this morning, both walking around here with a cane. I saw my, my brother's granddaughter, who because of uh, her mother's methadone use, is blind. Can't see. Had, I think, three heart surgeries before she was one year old. Sweet little girl. Sweet little girl. Right. She's, uh, she's in the public school system. She's in honor classes. And she can't see. But she can do a lot of things. And, and that's usually it's been my experience when when because of men, uh, children have been robbed of some faculty, they usually, God, God emphasizes other faculties in their life. But there will be a day when my brothers won't need things. There will be a day when that little girl, whatever age she might be, will see perfect. There will be a day when she has a resurrected body, whereas it speaks here in Romans 8, the redemption of our body. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more tears. God has a, an eternity for us that is truly overwhelming. This eternal life is...
accomplished by God in the Old Testament. It was spoke of back in the 133rd Psalm. It said, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Life evermore. Even back in the Old Testament. Daniel 2.2 2 speaks to the 12.2 speaks to this. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake. Some to everlasting life. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. This was also sought by the Jews of Jesus' time. If you remember Luke 10, 25, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Man is driven to seek eternal life. That's why in the in the whenever they you know there are there are still discovering new civilizations on earth, new tribes. Way back in, in Brazil, way back in, in, the, in the recesses of Africa. And they all have one thing in common. They all worship a God. Man has an eternal need for God. He has an eternal concern about his own eternity. This eternal life that we speak of tonight comes only to those that believe God's testimony about his son. In, in Paul's words back in our original text tonight, he speaks in his son. See, the gospel is exclusive in nature. It is not inclusive. You live in an inclusive society where everyone should be included in everything. But the gospel is exclusive in that there are not many ways to God. There's only one way to God. John 14, 6 uh, tells us that. Peter declared it in Acts 4.12. There is nor, he said, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. See, our politicians want to tell us, well, it doesn't matter. Our, some of our religious leaders want to tell us, oh, we all, we all, we all serve the same God. There is only one. His Son is Jesus Christ. And the only way to find eternal life is to believe in Him. So again, in this section of Scripture, the purpose of God's testimony is totally and utterly obvious. It is so that all may obtain eternal life through, through God's Son, Jesus Christ. But you have to that he is the Son of God. If you don't believe that he's the Son of God, that's a big hole in your theology. This section ends with the response to God's testimony. So the last part of this section of Scripture is a response to God's testimony. Let's go back, and I want to read verses 10 and 12, uh, connecting the two together. And he says in verse 10, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And then if we go to the 12th verse, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. There are only two possible responses to God's testimony. You either believe it or you reject it. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. There's no position of neutrality. The words I didn't know. The words I was getting ready to. The words, well, uh, they didn't tell me the proper way. None of those words will be accepted. There will be no alibi at the great white throne judgment. All those that have turned their back on Christ will in fact be rejected. Matthew 12, 30 says, He who is not with me is against me. That's not an inclusive Christianity, folks. There's only one way to get there. John's words in this scripture tonight, he says, who, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. Saving faith in Jesus Christ re results in a lifelong hold on eternal life. My Savior died for my sins. His death was not cheap. He paid a terrible price for me and you to have eternal life with him. And we should hold on to that reality. We've previously spoken of the witness of God here 
by his word and by history in regards to who Christ is. And I want us to stop just for a minute and look at one other witness to this eternal life which we possess. And that is each and every one of us that sits here this evening. If you are a believer in the Son of God, that witness, God's witness, should be confirmed in your heart tonight. One of the reasons that we know we are Christians is that we have that fact in our hearts. And the stronger that fact is in your heart, the better off you are. And the more you believe, the better witness you will become. And the harder you do to do as God would have you do here in this temporal sphere, the greater your reward will be one day. Our churches are plagued by little faith. We need to be, listen to me, our churches are plagued by victims. I've said it before, I've heard it on TV, and I'll say it again because it's true. I had four people come up to me today to, to, to talk to me about setting up appointments next week. They're all victims of abuse. But see, vic to be a victim steals the victory. We have to get over being victims. And as a society of believers, we have to be victory minded. We have to start stop blaming people and we have to start overcoming those things in our life so that we can be all that God desires us to be. God, listen, all things are for God's purpose when they're properly utilized. There's nothing that we have experience that God can't use to further His kingdom. But if we want to, and I had a dear say to the Lord today, I know she's over 70 years old. I have to come talk to you. I've never been able to forgive. That's the first step to victory is forgiving. I've been forgiven. So I have to be forgiven. We have to be forgivers. That's how we get to, to be victorious, is to forgive. So our churches are, and that's the mind, and in many ways, I think, our churches have, have, have relished the idea that we're victims. Woe is me. See, churches, churches are hospitals for sinners. But as with any hospital, the end result should be to get you up out of the bed and get out there and get back to work for the Lord. And we're not doing that. We got whole, we got whole, whole hospitals just full of sick Christians that don't want to get back into the battle because of what's happened. And it all devolves to spiritual strongholds. Do you think, as we get closer to the end times? that the demons and Satan are going to receive their attacks on Christians? They're going to accelerate their attacks on Christians. We have to be stronger in the Word, stronger in our beliefs. And yet, we, we recede from the things we need to do. The Bible teaches us that we have an internal, listen to these words, internal testimony of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's the way it is supposed to function. If you, if back in Romans 8 again, I'll go back to Romans 8, it's expressed in Romans 8, 15 and 16. It says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage to fear. You can run around and allow the things that have happened to you to have a negative impact on you. But it says you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Those words, the best 
that Jesus Christ, in essence, is who God says He is. And to refuse that, you have refused the testimony of God towards His own Son. And God takes that pretty serious. See, what is it uh, Pharaoh says? He says that uh, people tell him all the time that uh, they don't want to believe in a God who would send people to hell. And that's the total wrong comprehension. That's, people aren't being sent to hell. People are going to hell. Without a doubt. There is, there's no way to get around it. Unless you believe in Jesus Christ. And then you can stop. If you can get to the small, narrow gate. Many will seek. They won't even find the gate. When it says many, it's talking about Christians. Incidentally, if you want to review the words. Many people will be sitting in churches today in America. They can't even find the gate to get onto the narrow path. That's what the word says. Okay? So, you know, it's not that God is sending anybody to hell. They deserve hell. Just like me and you. Sinners deserve hell. And if we can help people to understand that, then we can help them to understand that not believing God in regards to his testimony about his son makes him a liar. And when you consider that you or someone by their non-belief in Jesus Christ makes God a liar, that's blasphemy. The severest of all blasphemies, since it is against God. How can you blaspheme God who's perfect truth? You can't lie. And yet, we, we, we oh, it's okay. <coughs> They'll believe later. We'll condone it. <coughs> we'll, act, we'll be tolerant of that attitude. And the thing is, is that is an affront to God's righteousness. That is a damning sin to God. And yet, we will patronize that attitude in our churches. Oh, they'll get it right. It'll be okay. We comfort those people. We reassure them. Reassure them. We need to get in front of their faces and talk to them about the reality of who their lives are. About what their witness is. For a man to refuse to accept the witness of God regarding his son is to stand defiantly before God and to just let him be called a liar. It's not a proper, it's not a popular theology, but it is a proper theology. It's the theology that was taught for hundreds of years in our churches. Declining acceptance of Jesus Christ is the most blatant of all sins. John will close this section of scripture by setting the eternal results as we've read. The only two possible responses to God's witness. He says those, he, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Here again you see the exclusivity of the gospel. It's evident in those words. Only those who believe the Father's witness to His Son and then acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior will have eternal life. All who refuse to do so will not have the Son and consequently do not have eternal life. The glorious promise to those who believe God's testimony is that as many as received Jesus, to them He gave the right to become children of God, it says in John 1, 12, even to those who believe in his name. That's our heirship. We are uh, those who have shared in this eternal life. But again, there's a sobering warning to those who reject Jesus. It is in Hebrews 2, 3, it says, how will you escape? How will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? How will you escape? Son of the creator of the universe has come to make an offer. And there's a lot of us, even in our church,
churches that have turned our backs on that off. So, with that, we have some extra time, and I want to continue on. I, I, uh, uh, I want to try to get done with First John as soon as I can, so we can go and move ahead to something else. So, we close this section of Scripture that ends with First John 5.12, now we're going to begin with the next section, which uh, begins at 13 through 21. If you would stand once again for the reading of God. And if somebody <coughs> would read that for us, please. John, 1 John 5, 13 through 21, please. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we are asking anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and He will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. If there is sin leading to death, I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, from idols. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, this last section I want to I title What Christians Can Be Certain Of. And uh, there's many certainties spoken of here. And if there's one thing that you can be certain of in the world, it's that it's filled with uncertainty. Uh, I often say in regards to my golf game, the only thing consistent in my golf game is its inconsistency. The only thing certain in the world is it's uncertain. Uh, Job had a handle on this back in 14.1. He said, man who is born of woman is of a, full, of a, is of a few days and full of trouble. That's who man is. And later on, he, uh, well, in 5.7 he says, yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Just as easily as you see the sparks fly off a, a campfire, that's how easily man is in trouble. That's what Job was trying to say. James wrote in 4.14, You do not know what will, what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Our lives are so short. Illness, accidents, uh, violence, old age, all of these things catch up to us or happen to us in our lives, James says, are just like by, uh, vapors that disappear. Our life journeys are full of doubts. They're full of questions. They're full of uncertainties. Your job may change. You may have to move. The stock market plunges. Taxes increase. Relationships come and go in our society today as people's faithfulness lasts as long as their needs are being met. Everybody needs their needs met. We, we have come up now with this idea that we need to have prenuptial contracts prior to marriage. I won't marry anybody that wants to have a prenuptial contract because it says you don't trust each other and if you don't have trust in marriage you shouldn't be getting married anyway. You should be doing something different. So, but we do that. Our society has done that because people are so worried about being exploited by each other. We are an exploitive society. We take advantage of each other at every turn. And uh, on a larger scale, have you noticed, uh, maybe, maybe my problem is, is I'm getting older, because I'm having a little birthday. And maybe, maybe everybody as they get older has the same feeling, that society has eroded and is eroding at a quicker pace. But to me, there even seems to be an upturn in natural disasters, you know, earthquakes. The other, you know, the other day, Nikki and I were talking, there was one day, it seemed like there was an earthquake everywhere. And then we got all these tornadoes, and uh, hurricanes, and floods, and, and the world, see, is into accumulation. What can I accumulate? What can I hold on to? And in all those instances, when those things happen, accumulate,
manipulations can be gone in an instant. It is uncertainty over the future that drives people to spend a significant percentage of their income on insurance. Why do we buy insurance? Well, besides the part that they make us in some instances that are trying to make us in other instances, but we buy insurance to protect ourselves against negative contingencies. Car insurance provides us a measure of security if we're in an accident. We buy home insurance in case there's a fire, there's a theft, there's a flood. Health insurance, it protects us against financial ruin in case the breadwinner gets sick at home. But all of these concerns reside in the material realm, in the world realm. And it is not here that the most <coughs> profound uncertainties exist. No, it's in the spiritual, in the eternal realm that the most disastrous results can exist. Because when people reject the gospel, when people are without God, people are also without hope. In our society today, in many ways, is hopeless. Ephesians 2.12 speaks to that condition. It says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. People in this condition are without protection against divine wrath. And that's a bad position to be in. Because divine wrath includes with it the eternity of hell. Most will put their hope in false religions, realistically. The way is narrow. Most, uh, many will put their hope in personal ideologies. They will attempt to develop a personal, happy state of mind that will take them along their path as they go down their road of life. Many have expressed the thought that all religions lead to heaven, and that most people are good, and thus they're headed there too. Most people are good. It's taught. It's taught in some of the major denominations in our churches. What is not popular in our society today is the truth. The truth that the Bible is the only true word of God. The truth that the gospel is the only way to heaven. And the truth that all who do not believe the gospel will go to hell forever. Those are certain. The world is full of uncertainties. Words such as relativism, humanism, are, are deceptions that we live by which revolve around the absolute truth of God and attempt to make it gray rather than the black and white which it is. There are five words that I want to speak to you initially about tonight that are which we base biblical absolutes on. Which frame, which frame the paradigm that we're confronted with in our society. Remember this morning, I spoke about a paradigm. It's the environment, the history, the experiences that you've lived in your life that now impact how you see things. It's like a big picture frame that has all of those things built into it that you've experienced in your life, and now you look at everything through that picture frame. The first word I want you to Remember, today is objectivity. Truth. Listen to me. Truth is objective. It cannot be subjective. You and I do not get to define what truth is. Truth exists outside of the human mind, and it has one origin, and truth resides in God. And it is revealed to us in Scripture. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Man, your, you, I, our society, our Congress, has no business defining what truth is. Because as soon as it does, it will mess it up. There's only one truth. It's God. 
And that's why America was so successful in its founding, because it placed itself upon that one truth. And then, now, it has wandered away. The second word is rationality. The revelation of God is intelligible. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying God's revelation is not in any way, shape, or form mystical. It's not hidden. It's not something that you've got to have a special key to. It's not only for the religious elite. Scripture yields itself to any mind that approaches it in a reasonable, rational manner. I don't understand it. No. You can't say you don't understand it. It is God's revealed word. It is there for one express purpose, for you to understand it. Why do you think he had to write it down? To hide it from you? The problem is, is we don't want to expend the effort. That's the problem. Well, I've never heard that. I've never known that. I am in no way, shape, or form superiorly, intellectually superior to you. <clears throat> but I tell you what, I'll outwork you when it comes to the Word of God. Because there's nothing more important. The Word of God is meant to be rational to you. It's up to you to dig up the treasures that are hidden for you. Third word is veracity. The, pro the Bible, when it is properly interpreted in a normal fashion, expresses the truth of God. It is voracious. It, is, it, it, it naturally yields a divine truth when you seek it out. God's word is true, and it will fill you Filled? Yeah. What more would you want? God's word is full of truth for you. The fourth word is authority. The divinely revealed truth of Scripture bear God's authority. And hence, God's word affirms itself. God will affirm his word in your life each and every day as you grow to recognize his truths in your life. It will be, that's part of the process of sanctification. I've known Chris for a few years. Chris isn't who he was when I first met him. He's been, he has become more enamored in the authority and the truth of God's Word. Because he has a desire to understand what God's trying to say to him. And the final word, then, is incompatibility. Because the Bible contains divine truth. Anything that it contradicts is wrong. Anything. Homosexuality is wrong. Plain and simple. Why can't you get a politician in America to say, homosexuality is wrong. And it's taken our country down the toilet. And you can't say it. That's the country we live in. You can't say that anymore. Because it's not a living being. <laughs> Welcome to 22nd century America. We have no one to blame but ourselves. Biblical Christianity's commitment to absolute truth, again, makes it exclusive in a world that cries out for everyone to be included and everything. And ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't work that way. That's why they call us the elect. There's a difference between children of God and children of Satan. God's word is incompatible with anything that adds to it, subtracts from it, or changes it in any way, shape, or form. And I don't care what, what version you have, what flavor you God's word speaks the truth in all varieties. The truth that the Bible reveals is all-encompassing. It tells of how the universe began, and it tells how the universe is going to end. That's 
that's good. It tells them why people behave the way they do. It tells them what is really right and what is wrong. It tells us of heaven. It tells us of hell. It tells us of how people get to one place or the other. It gives you a roadmap for good human relationships. It tells us of the promises of God. Most significantly, it tells us of His Son, Jesus Christ. It tells us of His virgin birth, His sinless life, His unparalleled teaching in the history of the world, His substitutionary death on the cross, His literal physical resurrection, His bodily ascension, and impending second coming. It's all in the Word of God. Want to be an expert? Be an expert in the Word of God. It will hold you in a position that will make your life more liable to be successful in God's eyes. Scripture presents many, many absolute certainties. See, the world is full of uncertainties. These are certainties. These include, and I believe they're in your notes, so I'm going to run through you. These are include, but are not limited to, sin has consequences. In Numbers 32, 23, it says, but if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and your sin will find you out. That means your sin has consequences. The Bible is true. That's a certainty. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Another certainty. Righteousness brings with it a reward. Proverbs Righteousness brings with it a reward. Proverbs 11:18. The wicked man does deceptive work, but he who sows righteousness will have a sure reward. God alone is God. Isaiah 43:10 through 12. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe him and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. God can do all things, Job 42, 2. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Words from Job's mouth. God will not act wickedly. That's a certainty you can live your life by. Job 34, 12. Surely God will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. He judges, God judges according to the truth. That is another certainty. Revelation 16, 7. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. True and righteous are your judgments. God is faithful, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. God punishes sin, that's a certainty, Romans 2, 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. He created everything, Isaiah 48, 13. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. They stand up together. God created humans. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that He is the Lord. He is God. It is He who has made us. It is He who has made us, and not we. Not we ourselves, evolutionists. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. He is good. He is merciful. Psalm 23, 6. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Certainty that Jesus bore our grief and our sorrows, Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has been born, he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. <clears throat> Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. We know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Holy One of God. That is a certainty, John 6, 69. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We know that he knows all things, John 16, 30. We are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus was sent by his Father, John 17, 8. For I have been given to, the, to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and they have known surely that I came forth from you that they believe that you sent me. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Matthew 9, 6.
that you may know that the Son of God has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Jesus will not reject those that come to him. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. If you come to him, he will never reject you. Another certainty, he knows those who are his. In John 10, 14, it says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. I am known by my own. He has entered into God's presence, and he is now there on our behalf. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. This hope we have is an anchor. This is a hope. Listen to this hope. This is an anchor of your soul. This is something that should hold you together no matter what. Both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner, Jesus, has entered for us, and then it says, even Jesus, having become our high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, he has made our sacrifice for us as our high priest. He will return, it tells us in Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. God's promise of salvation is guaranteed. That's a certainty. Romans 4, 16. Therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all, that there will be a resurrection. There will be a resurrection, Job 19, 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. That God causes all things to work together for good for those who love Him. And we know that all things work together. Romans 8, 28. We know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That sinners do not inherit the kingdom of God, that is a certainty. Ephesians 5, 5. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That the day of the Lord will come, it tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And that God will help and support his people. God's word says that he will help us and support us. Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right. Those are absolute certainties, according to the Word of God. If you wanted to start an institution of higher education, if you wanted to start a, a new church body, those are foundational truths that you can build it on. Because through those truths, all things flow. As we have seen write, John write this epistle, he has been attempting to provide his readers with certainty about all that God has revealed concerning salvation. The formal argument of this letter has now ended with verse 512 that we ended our study on tonight. And as we read these next eight or nine verses, 13 through 21, we now have what I would consider to be the postscript. John's concluding remarks are not a collection, though, of random thoughts. They form a powerful climax what he has already written previous in, previously in the epistle. Throughout his letter, John has recycled tests to identify who a true Christian is. So you can do two things. First, so you can be assured of your salvation. Second, so you can identify false teachers. These tests serve an impassioned purpose I said by identifying phony believers and false teachers, but they also are there for a pastoral purpose, to give you the confidence and the assurance you should have in your life as genuine believers. That's why I wanted to teach 1 John first. 
to the family. Sunday night usually is the closest unit of the church. It is the familia. It is the, 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 the inner family of the family. And I don't want any of you to be under siege with not having total confidence in who you are in Jesus Christ. So now the epistle begins to build in a familiar crescendo. John focuses on five final thoughts in these last eight or nine verses. Five final things that you as a believer in Jesus Christ can be certain of. Those are eternal life, again. Answered prayer, again. Victory over sin, again. That you belong to God, again. And you can believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Every one of those things, he's already preached it to you once, but it's important enough for him to preach it to you again. And so it will be for us. So that's the intro to the last section. <coughs> Any thoughts? Comments? Yes, Valerie. We were watching a movie. I don't even know the name of it. It was about an earthquake and every earthquake was all over the world. And it was really the thing that kept coming back to me. Well, what's better than this? It would go out with a bang. I mean, because we know where we're going to be. Once we're not here, I, I just had that confidence the whole movie, so it didn't affect me. Those are earthquakes. Those are earth shattering. The words that was in Matthew 24, we see these things. Yeah, these are signs. Occurring in, in random order, and then they get more and more frequent with the woman who's ready to give birth. Be ready because he's standing up. Anything else? Anybody? Any questions?